Before moving on to uh, doing calculus of variations in high dimensional spaces, we're going to solve one more problem using the one dimension Euler Lagrange equation that we have derived. I've written out the problem here. So consider a string of length L attached to the origin, then place the string in the xy plane with its other end on the x axis so that the maximum area is enclosed between the string and the x axis. So let's see how this might work here. So here is the xy plane. And we're going to take a string that starts at the origin and then it ends on the x-axis. And we want this area underneath this string between it and the x-axis A to be maximum. So it seems at first blush that the functional that uh, would accomplish this is pretty simple. We're looking for y of x right? That's this curve that maximizes a. So the functional is just going to be a of y, and it's really just the integral from 0 to this x sub m here of y dx. So that looks simple. Unfortunately, we don't know how to solve this particular variational problem. Uh, remember the Euler-Lagrange equation that we derived a couple of videos ago it presupposes that you know both the starting point and the ending point for the path that you're taking. Here we know the starting point, but x of m is unknown. Uh, so, and it's a function of the solution. So it's not, we can't just apply Euler-Lagrange equation to this problem. Uh, we will not get anything useful. So, uh, XM is unknown and depends on solution. So what we have to do is change variables so that uh, we're going from a known starting point to a known ending point. And the clue to how to do that is in the problem here. We have the a fixed length L. So really what we want to do is uh, integrate along this curve from its starting point to its ending point, which is the distance L away from the origin, not along the x-axis, but along the string. Okay? So we now need to therefore change variables. We're going to change variables to uh, distance along the string. And we know, as we've already mentioned a couple of times, that the s squared is the x squared plus the y squared, right? And we can rewrite this such that uh, we get the x on one side here. So we can get that the x is the square root of the x squared minus the y squared. And then we can take the s outside of the uh, square root. s is now the independent variable. So the y and the s is actually s prime. So this is the s times the square root of 1 minus y prime squared. Okay. So now... We can cast this functional on a form that we can actually solve. So a is a function still of the function y. It's a functional still of the function y, but we're integrating from 0 to the total length l of this. y times the square root of 1 minus y primed squared ds. Okay, so this means that the function that's inside the integral here. Now it depends on y, y prime, and on s, right? So that is y times the square root of 1 minus y prime squared. 
right? What we want to find now is a stationary curve. Uh, the stationary curve is one that could maximize the area underneath here. Could also minimize it or, or not, but uh, we're looking for a stationary curve. Now this equation is a little trickier to solve than the ones in the previous two examples. In that case, the function inside the integral here depended only on y prime or, or x prime and the uh, dependent, then an independent variable. Uh, here we have f, which depends both on y and on y prime, which means that if we just were to plug this straight in here, we will get a second order differential equation. Nothing wrong with that in principle, but that's harder to solve than a first order differential equation. Uh, so if you can put this in the form of a first order equation, that would be better. And turns out in this case, there's a trick we can play uh, that makes that possible. In particular, we can note that this function f here does not depend explicitly on s, right? So f does not depend explicitly on s. And that makes it possible to do the following. I can take the whole derivative, the full derivative of f with respect to s, and just apply the chain rule. Right? So normally, um, if we had, uh, if f depended on s as well, we would have had this term here as well, partial df or partial ds, but that's equal to zero in this case uh, because there's no explicit dependence of f on s. This is important, so let me mark that separately. Okay, so uh, now we can make a couple of substitutions. The first thing we'll note as dy ds as a full derivative, that's just y prime. The y prime ds similarly is y double prime, although I'm actually going to leave that in this form. Uh, the f dy, we can just look here now at the euler lagrange equation, and we can see that the f dy is actually equal to this term. So we can make these substitutions, and we will obtain, I'm going to write it in this form for emphasis, like that. Right? Oh, and I forgot. Okay, so that's just rewriting this in a slightly different form. What it is somewhat suggestive, because what we have here is a derivative of s with respect to this component, uh, or with respect to this term times that term, plus this term now times the derivative of that one. This is really just a chain rule applied so we can see that this has to be equal to now ddS acting on y prime times the f the y prime. In other words, uh, we can take now this here and put it over on that side. So we will get then the ddS of f minus y prime partial df over partial dy prime equals zero, right? Because interestingly, we have here a derivative with respect to s and one over here that's with respect to s. So we get just this and then we can integrate. And that gives us that f minus y prime partial df partial dy prime equals a constant like that. So this is actually now the Euler-Lagrange equations uh, when uh, f here does not depend on the independent variable. So that's actually a convenient form to remember. And it does apply here, and it does have the advantage that it's also a first order differential equation. So what we need now is just apply 
uh, is just to calculate this using our specific function here, f. So we are looking for y prime times the partial df of a partial dy prime. That's going to be equal to y prime times the derivative of this. Now, um, because we're taking a partial derivative here, we don't have to care about y. y is a constant as far as y prime is concerned in, in our formulation here. Remember that partial, differ, uh, partial derivatives is, are only with respect to variables that ex appear explicitly in the function. So y prime appears explicitly, but y is not y prime in this case. So we only have to take that derivative there. Uh, so we end up then with so we get minus 2y prime and then we divide down here with 1 minus y prime squared. Okay, so now we have this, we can just plug it everything in and we will find where R is this constant. I just decided to name it R here. And then the rest is uh, basically a bit of algebra. So what I did here is I multiply by the square root of 1 minus y prime squared. And I get this. And these cancel. I mean, one other thing. This is just one, of course. So, since this cancel, I can now multiply by the square root of 1 minus y prime squared, and I get this. I'm going to square this, and I will get. Then we can integrate this. And again, in this problem, if you still remember it, we're starting from y equals 0. This integral is one you may not know off the top of your head, but you can look it up in your table of integrals. And you will do, if you do that, you will find that it equals to r times arc sine of y over r, and that has to equal to s. And we can invert that, so we get therefore that y of s equals r times sine of s over r. R. Okay, but we're not quite done yet uh, because we have certain uh, conditions we have to impose, right? Remember, we have end conditions. So one of those is that y of zero has to be zero because the first end of the string is at the origin. But the other condition is that y of l also has to be zero. Again, recall that the end of the string here, where, where, the, where s has to be equal to l, y has to be on the x-axis, right? 
So those are our end conditions. So the sign here therefore has to be zero when s equals to L. And that means that um, L over R equals N times pi, right? Where N can be any number, one, two, three, etc. even zero in principle. Well, that would be a boring solution because um, in that case, we just have Y of S equals to zero. So this means, of course, that R equals L over N pi. And that gives us then that Y of S equals L over N pi times sine over pi N S over L. So um, those are in principle all the solutions. The only problem is that there are many of them. Uh, n can be any value from zero to infinity, and it can be negative two. Uh, so that isn't very useful. Only one of them can be the uh, correct maximum, can yield the correct maximum. And in principle, then we have to do a bunch of other analysis to, to figure out which one it is. However, we can just look at it and see that the only solution here that does not cross zero, and that isn't just y equals to zero, is obtained for n equals one, right? So we, we have to have that n equals one, that's the correct solution, because if n is greater than, than one, that means we must have a smaller area, because those solutions correspond to this type of behavior, right? The string crossing the x-axis, and that then must be a smaller area. That's very encompassing. Also, n equals zero, that's a trivial solution, which basically means that the, the string is only confined to the uh, x-axis, which is not so interesting. So uh, we find that finally, the correct solution is that y equals l over pi times sine pi s over l. Okay, now uh, the only problem with this solution is that it's not on a very convenient form. So we'd like to put it on a form where we have y in terms of x. So to do that, um, we go up here and retrieve from earlier in our notes. The result we have here, that the x equals the s times the square root of one minus uh, y prime squared. So in other words, the x ds, which is x prime, is the square root of one minus y prime squared. Now, the square root of one minus y prime squared, sorry for going back and forth so much, but uh, the square root of one minus y prime squared from up here is actually just y over r. So we can use that result here. So this is y over r, and we know that y is r times sine, is r times sine of s over r. So this just becomes equal to sine of uh, s over r, that's the same as sine of pi s over l with the solution that we're interested in. And then now we can integrate this. I guess I'm going back to using r here instead of uh, pi over l. It's a little bit more convenient. So what we have now is a complete solution. We have found x as a function of s and y as a function of s. We can put them here together.
So that's one form that we can write the solution in. It's a parametric equation. Uh, what I would like to do, though, is put it on a more implicit form. So uh, what we'll do is we'll take this form here of x equals r times 1 minus cosine s over r and rewrite it. And if we do that, do that over here, then we get that x minus r equals r times cosine of s over r. And then we'll square this. I guess I left out the minus sign here, but that minus sign is actually not important because we're taking the square. And then we can see uh, that this equals r squared times 1 minus sine squared of s over r. Right, because sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Uh, but r times sine over s, uh, r times sine of s over r, that's just y. Bring it up a little bit so you can see here. Right, So we can just substitute this in here. So we get that this is actually r squared minus y squared. And this finally, therefore, gives us this solution. Now you should be able to recognize this as the equation for a circle, or actually, in this case, a semicircle, because we're only interested of for y's greater than zero. And the semicircle, it's centered at the coordinates x, y equals r comma zero. So uh, if we plot this, it looks like this. Right. So here's our string, um, starting out at the origin, and then reaching the x-axis at the maximum point here. Remember the length l here is r times pi. That was the result that we found, and that's consistent with all this. So the way uh, we're maximizing the area underneath the spring, underneath the string, is to make it form a semicircle. And that's kind of intuitive. Uh, that's possibly what you would have guessed if uh, you hadn't done this calculation. But now we've been able to mathematically prove that this is indeed the correct solution. This is the area that maximizes, this is the configuration of the string that maximizes the area. Now, we did come up with several other solutions, remember, and, and those, um, you know, look something like this. Those are also correct solutions to the problem. Uh, they made the functional stationary, but it didn't correspond to a maximum area, as you might be able to see from, from their shape here. So, um, when we're doing variational calculus the way we are doing, we will not necessarily come up with a maximum or a minimum, but a stationary point, and it's up to us to do additional analysis to find uh, which corresponds to the maximum or minimum that we're looking for. Now, when we apply this to mechanics, it turns out that is never a problem, which is why I'm not going over any techniques for, for actually doing this.